going on guys welcome back in today's video i'm going to guide you through the full installation of the windows subsystem for linux so let us get right into it so for those of you who don't know what the windows subsystem for linux is also called wsl it is basically a linux system running inside of windows so you have a linux terminal on windows but at the same time it's not a virtual machine and it's also not just a terminal emulation it's not just a clone of the linux terminal you have an actual linux system running inside of windows uh, in the form of a command line, basically, but you don't have only the command line. You can also run graphical user interface applications with a little bit of additional work. But what it can look like in the end when you have installed it and set it up is somewhat like that. You can open up a terminal, you can do all the Linux commands. I can also call something like NeoFetch, for example, and you can see that I have Ubuntu installed here in the terminal. And you can also see that if I run HTOP, we can see all the processes running here. Um, and I can even run some graphical user interface applications here. So for example, Nautilus, which is a file explorer, and you can see that I have this Linux style graphical user interface on Windows. So we have an actual Linux system running on Windows. And you don't need to worry about compatibility or anything because we're not radically modding our system. The Windows subsystem for Linux is developed by Microsoft. So it's not just uh, some, I don't know, a uh, fancy modification of some guy in the internet. It's actually produced by Microsoft and well integrated into the system. Um, the first thing we need to do in order to install the Linux subsystem or the Windows subsystem for Linux here is we need to go to the features. So we're going to go to the start menu and we're going to type features. And you can see here, turn Windows features on or off because what you need to turn on, uh, what you need turned on here in order to be able to do this, you need to turn on the virtual machine platform feature. So if you don't have a check here in this checkbox, you need to click it and press OK. In addition to that, this is something that I cannot guide you through because it's specific to your machine to your laptop computer, uh, you need to go into your BIOS and also turn on the virtualization uh, functionality. So if your BIOS is blocking the virtualization, you're not going to have any success here. So you need to make sure that your system uh, is able to virtualize and you need to turn on that feature. Once you have that, you go to the start menu once more and you type store or Microsoft store, you just click on a Microsoft store. And now you can just search for the distribution that you're interested in. So you can go for Ubuntu if you want to. You can also, by the way, just type Linux and see all the different distributions here. You can go with Ubuntu, which is what I have installed on my machine here. You can go with Debian if you want to, so just Debian, and you can also install Debian. Uh, you can go with uh, OpenSUSE. You can go with Kali Linux and all that. Um, in this video, I'm going to go with Debian because I don't have Debian installed. I have Ubuntu installed and I don't want to remove all the settings and all the things that I've set up. The process is kind of similar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to install Debian to show you the basic installation process. It's a very simple process. I just have to pick a username and a password basically and that's it. And then once we are, we are at a certain level, I'm just going to show you the steps in Ubuntu or if it doesn't make a lot of difference, I'm just going to proceed on Debian. So what you do is you go to the app and you install it. In this case, it's loading. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to go with Debian. And what you do is you go to Debian here and you click on install. So it's going to take a while. It's going to download it. I think it's about 800 megabytes or something or 700 megabytes. I'm not sure. Uh, however, we're going to skip that download part and I'm going to get back to you once it's done. So once the download is finished, you're going to see this terminal here pop up, it's going to install for a couple of minutes, and then it's going to ask you for a username. In this case, I'm just going to go with neural nine. And then we're going to enter a password one, two, three, four, five, of course, please pick a secure one. Uh, we're going to retype it. And once this is done, we are already inside of the Linux system here. So this is the Debian uh, Linux system that we have here. And the first thing that I would like to do, at least for this video, you can do whatever you want. I like to increase the font size because otherwise you guys won't be able to read anything. So I'm going to increase it to 28 and I'm going to also uh, change the layout a little bit. So let's go with height of 25 and a width of, I don't know, 110 maybe. There you go. That's fine. So now we can already go with some basic things here. You can do LS, you can do PWD. 
uh, we can navigate through the system. Now, one thing that you need to keep in mind here is that if you just remain in that directory here that you are right now, you are inside of the Linux system. So, of course, I'm in the user directory here and I can create documents and downloads and desktop, whatever, but I'm not on my Windows system. If I want to go to my Windows system, if I want to access the files on the Windows system, I need to go back two times. And here you can see the individual directories. We need to go to the mount directory, so to the MNT directory. And we're going to just say CD MNT. And here you can see, okay, we have C. Then we have users. We have, in my case, Flory. And then we have desktop. And now we are at the desktop. So now we are navigating, uh, navigating through the Windows files. So if you are in your Linux subsystem and you want to go to the Windows files, uh, you want to go to slash mount slash C and then you know you navigate and of course if you have different partitions you should also be able to see those here. So that is a very basic thing that we have here. Now what we also need is or what we don't need but what we want to do as a first step is in my opinion it's very annoying that when you do certain things you're going to get a lot of error sounds. So if I I don't know type some file name here and then I press tab you can hear that, right? I hope you can hear that in the video. I get these annoying sounds whenever I try to do some auto completion uh, that doesn't work. or Whenever I try to delete something that's not there, you can hear the error sounds. If you want to get rid of those, you can do that in three ways or you have to take three steps to get rid of this annoying bell sound. The first thing is you want to get rid of the bell sound inside of the bash. The second thing is you want to get rid of the bell sound inside of the Vim, uh, the Vim editor and you want to get rid of the bad, uh, of the bell sound inside of less with dub, uh, with double s. So the first thing is we go to the input rc file. So we can just use vim to do that. Uh, I think vim is installed by default, right? So if I just type vi, yes, we have vim. I think we should also have nano, right? Okay, so you can pick the editor that you prefer. Uh, I'm going to go with vim and we want to edit the input rc file. It's located at E T C and then input RC. This is the file that we want to change. In order to change it, we have to go with VI. And in order to be able to overwrite that file, so to make actual changes, we're going to need sudo. So the super user do command here. Let me just check one more time. My camera is not blocking anything. I'm going to move it to the upright here, uh, to the to the upper right here. Um, there you go. So we're going to go to the input RC file and we're going to enter the password here. And here we can see individual settings that we can set and you can just do it manually here. As you can see here in Vim, you also he, uh, hear these error sounds. If you want to remove the bell sound, you need to uncommon this set bell style none here. So we're just going to delete. Come on. Oh man. Let me just do it with nano then. So sudo nano etc input rc. I had some difficulties right now. Uh, so you want to uncommon this set bell style none. We're going to save that. There you go. Exit. And now if I if I close the terminal and then open it up again. So if I close it and then open Debian again. Now if I write some nonsense and press tap, as you can see, or as you can hear, there's no bell sound. Um, if you want to do the same thing in Vim, you need to manipulate or you need to change the Vim RC file. However, of course, if you're using NeoVim because you already installed it, uh, you have to do the same thing in the init.vim file. But those of you who are using Vim probably know how to set up Vim. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to uh, the Vim file, which is dot vimrc from the user directory. And here we don't have anything. So we're basically creating it. Um, and what we want to do here is we want to say, set visual bell. Now if I do this again, oh, come on. If I do some nonsense here, you can see there's no bell sound. All right. The last thing is that we also want to remove the bell sound from the less uh, type of applications or whenever we are in a less mode, uh, which is written like that. Uh, we want to also remove the bell sound. And for that, we have to 
to change the dot profile file, which is basically located at user directory slash dot profile. And what we do here is we basically, let me just go to the end of the file here. Uh, we basically just add the line, which is a little bit more complicated. So let me just take a look at it. It's export less equals and then dollar less r q and that's basically it so we also get of the get rid of the bell sound there so this is how you remove the annoying bell sound if you want to if you like it for some reason if you need it for some reason if it doesn't bother you you can just ignore this but with these three steps you can remove the annoying bell sounds from the uh from the wsl terminal so we're now going to switch to the Ubuntu terminal because I don't want to use Debian. I just installed Debian because I didn't want to uninstall Ubuntu. The steps are the same, so you can choose whatever distribution you like. Of course, they're different. OpenSUSE is going to be a little bit different than Debian and Ubuntu. Ubuntu is going to be a little bit different than Debian, but since I use Ubuntu mainly, and I would also recommend you to use Ubuntu if you're a beginner, uh, I'm going to proceed with Ubuntu here. So we're going to go with Ubuntu. And now we're going to talk about tools, interesting and useful tools that we uh, that I recommend you to install on the Windows subsystem for Linux. And the first one is Vim or NeoVim. But as we already know, Vim is installed already. So what do I mean by that? I mean, configure Vim or NeoVim to be a good editor, I would recommend you personally, to just start using Vim in a command line, you don't have to use it as your main editor to replace Visual Studio Code or PyCharm. Uh, use it whenever you're in the terminal, don't use Nano, uh, or Actually, I don't want to say don't use Nano, use whatever you want. But I recommend you to use Vim because Vim can make you very efficient. I like Vim. I'm uh, a big, big fan of Vim. And I would recommend you to just take the time and learn to use Vim and also set up a nice looking Vim because the basic Vim is pretty boring. If I just go with VI and then, you know, test.py, for example, it's a very basic editor here. As you can see, I didn't even... Uh, didn't even disable the bell because I don't use the ordinary uh, ordinary Vim. However, if you choose to install something like NeoVim, you can set it up in a very, very nice way. So let me show you what you can do with NeoVim. Let's navigate to Neural Dir and let's go to Object Recognition, for example. If I open up NeoVim here, you can see, first of all, I have a file explorer. I can open the main.py file. It has nice syntax, hi syntax highlighting and auto completion, I can open the file explorer here to the left, I can open uh, a tag bar to the right here. And you can see information here, I also have uh, this airline down here. So Vim doesn't have to be a boring and limited editor, it can have a lot of plugins. So what I would recommend you is to take a look at my video, uh, where I show you my Neo Vim setup, it, I think it's even called my Neo Vim setup. And I would recommend you to get a nice editor for your terminal choose Vim, choose Emacs, choose uh, Nano if you like to, but you should be able to use a terminal editor if you'll if you're working on a Linux terminal in general, not just for the uh, for the Windows subsystem here. Um, so the next tool that I would recommend you to install is htop htop is basically just a very basic task manager in the terminal. And uh, you install it by saying sudo apt install and then htop. And once you have that you're going to have this very simple tool where you see all the processes, you can terminate them, you can uh, kill them, you can filter, you can search, you can see the usage up here, you can see the memory usage, the CPU usage and all that. Uh, so a very basic tool that I like to use or that I have to use oftentimes when something is stuck and I need to kill a process or something, highly recommend you to get htop here. Uh, besides that, uh, by default, you're not going to be able to use commands like if config. So if you try to do it, actually, I can show it to you if we go to Debian here, because I didn't install it there yet. If I type F, if config, you're not going to see or you're going to see that this command is not found. So if you want to install it, what you do is you type sudo apt install, and then net dash tools, this is what you're going to need in order to be able to run if config. So also something that I would recommend you to get. Uh, and besides that, what do we have here? Yeah, you can get NeoFetch if you want to just to get some information about the system. So you can say, let me just uh, press enter until I'm not hiding anything from the camera here. Um, you can just type sudo apt install NeoFetch. And once you have that, you can run NeoFetch. And you're going to get some information about the system. First of all, the Ubuntu logo here. 
uh, the OS, the kernel, the uptime, the packages, the theme, the icons, terminal, whatever, CPU, memory. Uh, so just a basic tool to get some information about your system. And besides that, I would just recommend you to get all sorts of developer tools, depending on what you're going to use this Windows subsystem for Linux for, because, you know, you, you don't install this just because you're cool. You need this to compile certain things. Maybe you want to compile for Linux. Uh, maybe you want to compile for Android when you have some Python Kiwi app, for example, you want to compile it to Android. Install the necessary tools that you need here. Install a compiler for C, for C++. Install Python. Uh, install whatever you need basically because we don't use this just for fun we use this Linux system here because it's useful because oftentimes when we develop something when we use a framework when we need to compile something we want to have a powerful terminal which is not the CMD and maybe you don't want to use PowerShell maybe you're inexperienced with PowerShell and you like to use Linux then this is what you want to do here you want to install all the developer tools that you need so last but not least we want to be able to display graphical user interface content uh, by default, if we try to call a graphical user interface app or if we try to plot something, for example, with a Python script and matplotlib, it's not going to be able to display anything because we're limited to the terminal. We don't have any display to export this to. And in order to change that, we need to install the Xming server, the Xming X server, uh, which you can find on sourceforge.net slash project slash Xming. You can just download it, install it and run it. It's not too complicated but it always needs to be running if you want it to be able to show graphical user interface content. Uh, so install it, run it, and you can just uh, add it to the startup. So it's always running in the background. You can see down here it's running. And once it's running, you just need to set it up correctly. You need to go to the bash RC file, uh, which is located at the user directory and then slash dot bash RC. You can edit it with Vim or with Nano, whatever. I'm going to edit it with NeoVim. And once we're inside it, we just have to add the line export display equals localhost, then colon 0, 0.0. Now, I think there are also other commands that we can use. I'm not sure. Uh, I thought I, I think I saw a command that's a little bit more concise. But if you just say export display localhost 0, 0, uh, that should work out well. You need to do it in the bash RC file because otherwise you would have to do it every time you run the terminal manually. So if you just want to test it, you can just enter the command and then call a graphical user interface app. But if you want, uh, want it to always be uh, set up correctly, you need to add it to the bash RC file. Once you have that line here, you need to restart, of course, the terminal. So close it, open it up again. And now you can try to open a graphical user interface app. Now you can call gedit, you can open up Nautilus, but of course you need to install these because they're not installed correctly. Uh, they're not installed at all. In fact, uh, if you want to try it, if you just want to make, uh, make a test if it works, you can install the x11 app. So you can just say sudo app, uh, sudo apt install x11 dash apps like that. And in my case, I already have them. And then you can just call X eyes, for example. And you can see that there you go, graphical user interface, we can close it, we can also call X edit, I think, then we have a basic editor here. And you can do the same thing, of course, with actual graphical user interface apps, for example, Nautilus, as I showed you in the beginning, uh, opens up this file explorer here. It's a little bit buggy, don't be confused, but it also works with matplotlib. Whatever you try to display will be displayed using the server. Now, if we exit from here, if we close this, we're not going to be able to do this anymore. So I try to open Nautilus, doesn't work, doesn't know where to display it. So I need to make sure that Xming is constantly running so I can start it again and I can give it a try and there you go. It works again. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting the like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.